It's two days before Christmas in 1982. A terrorist bomb destroys the Israeli consulate in Sydney. Miraculously, no one is killed. I thank God that I'm, I'm still here to talk about it. Um, it was obviously very much a life-threatening situation. But the terror that day isn't over. Seven kilometres across town in Bondi, another bomb is about to be set off. Three men drive a 1971 Valiant into the car park of the predominantly Jewish Harkoa Club. The recently purchased Valiant is on its last legs. The reverse gear doesn't work. So the terrorists push it into the parking space. Then they need a screwdriver to open the broken boot. But there's a witness to what's going on. An elderly club member sees the three men toying with something at the rear of the car. What they're doing is arming a bomb. It's set to explode at 6.45. Hundreds are about to have dinner upstairs. The explosion shakes the building and devastates the car park. Despite the power of the blast, no one is injured. It would have killed hundreds of people because it was dinner time at the Hakao Club. There were hundreds of people upstairs at the time. If it had acted as it has, it had and brought that building down, it would have killed them. You know, I thought, oh, what, what's going to happen now? I mean, two in one day, it just, um, it just it didn't happen like that. And uh, I thought, what's, the, what's, what's going to happen next? More than three decades later, police are reinvestigating the two attacks, which they say were carried out by an international terror group called May 15. During the 1980s, the group was responsible for dozens of attacks on Israeli and US targets right around the world. May 15 was an Iraqi-based uh, terrorist group headed by Abu Ibrahim. He is uh, responsible for making the bomb for the Israeli consulate and part of one of his devices was used in the Harkoa Club as well. We believe that people flew into Australia and had local assistance. Some of these people are still in Australia? Yes, they are. They're part of our community in Australia today. Those locals played a key role in the bombings. Nine days before the attacks, they came to a car yard here on Parramatta Road in Sydney. They liked the look of the 1971 Green Valiant, despite all its defects, and they were particularly interested in the size of its boot. They picked the vehicle up the day before the attack on the Akawa Club. So there is a direct link, we believe, between the purchase of the vehicle, the installation of the device within the boot, and the transport of that vehicle to the Akawa Club to where it actually was detonated. This is what the terrorists wanted to happen. The explosion was intended to bring down a weight-bearing wall and reduce the club to rubble. But like the consulate bomb, it failed to detonate as planned. So, Dave, here we are at the Hakoa Club. This is the supporting wall they were trying to bring down. Well, you can see the absolute damage done to the rear of the vehicle, how it's been pushed into place to try and collapse this wall and then bring the building down on top of that. One of the vital clues was the discovery of gas bottles in the boot of the car. And this is the, uh, or one of the gas bottles we can see here. Again, we're in the rear of the Valiant and we can see the gas bottles, which has come from the State Rail Authority of New South Wales, uh, where this device or this component has been sourced. Those gas bottles from the Rail Authority and other items recovered after the blast at the Harkoa Club provided invaluable evidence for investigators. The device at the car club was constructed of two LPG cylinders and also a drum of petrol. We've been able to track them down to coming from a particular area within the SRA known as the Central Parcels Office. Wanted can exclusively reveal that police have re-examined the timing device and other crime scene exhibits. 
This new evidence is bringing them closer to the terrorists. We've been able to use new investigative techniques and forensic processes. As part of that, we've been able to harvest DNA samples from various exhibits, including the bomb components, and also we've been able to locate several fingerprints at both crime scenes. How valuable are those sort of clues for you? We now have direct evidence of the fingerprints of those that are involved and DNA profiles of those that have been closely linked to the construction of the device. For us, they're significant breakthroughs. With the bomber's DNA and fingerprints on file, police want to speak to anyone who worked at the New South Wales State Rail Authority with access to the gas cylinders. There was only three or 400 people working at Central Passes Office. So from our perspective, there is three to 400 people that have direct knowledge or access to those gas cylinders, and I'd encourage them to come forward and give us any information about relation to the gas cylinders, use of gas cylinders, or any other political active groups or individuals that may be of interest or note to them back in 1982. These are international criminal offences and these people must be brought to justice and we're appealing to the public to uh, come forward and tell us anything that they know that might assist us in that regard because uh, terrorism is not an acceptable crime to be committed in this country.